So in today's video, we are going to be talking about none other than the Benko Gambit. It is one of Black's most interesting openings that they can play versus 1d4. And in this video, I'm going to be focusing on the ideas which are really important to know when you play this opening, not just the theory, because ultimately, if you know the theories, but not the middle game ideas, you are going to be very lost when you actually play this opening. But that being said, how does this opening typically arise? And more well, typically, it arises through the moves d4, knight f6, c4, c5, d5, when now black plays b5. Of course, white can go for stuff along the way, like the London system, when that's a completely different opening, but when white goes to the main line opening and allows us to choose whatever opening we so desire, it is in this position that we will go c5, and after d5, there are several different options for black, such as e6 and Mon Benoni, but in this video, we will be talking about the Benko Gambit, of course. But that all being said, this video is mainly going to comprise of four different sections. The first one is going to be covering the what we'd call accepted lines, where white, and probably the most important section as well, where white takes, and after a6, black's trying to open more lines on the queen side, uh, white decides to take another pawn. The second section is going to be on what happens when white declines a gambit, say they just play a move like knight f3 developing their piece, and they don't bother taking on b5. And the final section is what we'd call the partially accepted uh, binko, where white, say, takes on b5, and after a6, in this position, they do not take on a6, instead they might play a move such as b6, where they again return the pawn, they might play something such as f3 as well, and build up a big center with e4. We're going to discuss all of these uh, possibilities in the third section. And last but not least, the final section is going to be discussing a little bit more of the recent theoretical developments that have been happening in the last years with the Benko Gambit for those who are a slightly more advanced players. Okay, diving right into the first part and probably the most important part of this video if you were to only watch one part of it, which is going to be the fully accepted uh, line, which begins with A takes, sorry, C takes B5 rather, A6, and now B takes A6. And I guess before we even show any further concrete moves on the board, what is Black really like trying to do in this opening? Why is the Benko Gambit not just a really bad opening? Because if it was, I, I wouldn't be talking about it in this video. And some of you more advanced guys might already sort of know this, but basically the, the point of the Benko Gambit is not to sort of sacrifice a bunch of pawns or we on to gain initiative and sort of attack your opponent's king. That, that basically never happens. Rather, what the idea of the Benko Gambit is, in stark contrast to a lot of other gambits where, again, you go for more of that dynamic initiative straight out of the opening, but instead in the Benko, you aim to create some open lines on the queen side, which you can create some very dangerous, often, positional pressure on your opponent. And the thing that makes the Benko Gambit such a difficult opening to deal with again is that unlike many other gambits where it's like concretely very often you can sort of defuse them very early on it's like as long as they don't get to your king you know you're okay in the benko it's not quite like that very often this pressure on the queen side persists throughout the game and the white player really has to have a very precise knowledge of even like the opening theory or like the ensuing middle game position to really ensure that they don't really just get their balls busted but okay, to, to dive into like what Black is really aiming for, the ideal setup that they want when they play this sort of against this fully accepted line, they are usually going to take on a6 at some point. Very often people delay this for a move by playing uh, g6. Taking is also playable immediately. There are some slight nuances as to why this is a bit more accurate. I'm not sure if I'll dive into this video. We'll have to see, but okay, knight c3, bishop takes a6. And in this position, white has two main moves. The modern one that's considered best these days is e4. Uh, the slightly more archaic one, shall we say, is the white fiend could its bishop. And sort of older wisdom had it that, you know, you didn't want to go e4 as much because, like, okay, while well, it is logical place in the pawn in the center, of course you do lose castling rights, and it's not a huge deal because on the next move you're going to play g3 and king g2 and castle by hand. But still, if possible, these guys, you know, they wanted to just, you know, keep all their castling rights. They want to play in a very tr traditional manner, but with engines these days, uh, we, we say screw all of that and uh, just do this. And in particular, there's some very critical lines where, uh, say in this position, white can play a4. And we'll get to this more in a second. But illustrative purposes, let's say, let's say white plays rookie one, for example, which for a long time was sort of the, the main move in the position. And there's a couple different things black can do here. But to give you a gist of the general setup that the black wants to go for, we generally want to play a move such as either queen b6 
or queen a5 and just get our queen onto one of these two uh, files. The reason being that, of course, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of the compensation that black has in the Benko Gambit, pretty much all of it revolves around the play that we get on these two open files. So it, it really just makes sense that we're going to end up putting our queen on one of them because the heavy pieces are, are going to, of course, do a lot of the work on these two files. So after, say, something like queen a5, white just plays a random move such as a3, let's say, Rook fb8, this is the basic setup that you want to have in mind when you think of the Benko Gambit, where we have essentially all of our heavy pieces operating on the A and B files. And if you take a moment to really observe what is going on, you'll quickly realize that it's actually very difficult for white to like appropriately unravel from this position. Maybe they want to play a move such as bishop d2, b3 and sort of consolidate, but of course, like if they go b3, well they hang the knight, if they go bishop d2, then they like run into like rook takes b2 right and generally from my experience at least from playing this a bit when i was younger and also coaching some people and seeing the way their opponents play at this level i feel like for players under say 2000 the benko is of course playable way above that but especially under 2000 people really just do not know how to play these positions at all which is again another big uh, aspect of why i really recommend this opening for many players however while it is very important to understand what black is aiming for when playing the benko gambit I think it is equally as important to understand what it is that white is aiming for. And this is a position that I had from one of my older Blitz games from a couple years ago where I had the white pieces. And essentially, I would regard this as the absolute dream like Benko Gambit position for white. It basically cannot get any better. We have our knights on these outposts C4, B5. If you also observe black's minor pieces, all of them look very passive. Their bishop is basically blocked in by this pawn here. Ours is considerably more active at least it has much more scope it's not blocked in by any pawns or anything like that at the moment of our choosing also because our pieces are just so much more active than blacks in general we might also try and break e5 in the center and really try and break apart black's position and just generally speaking right like black's rooks and their heavy pieces can barely do anything on the a and b files which of course when you play the benko gambit is sort of what you're trying to do and if you can't get anything there and you have nothing across the whole board basically and you're pulling down, that's probably not very good news. For example, to show how this may continue, well in the game I played Queen e1, sort of backing up the a5 square, so on the next move, I can put one of my minor pieces there and increase the pressure further on black's position. Black played knight b6, and to be honest, I wasn't paying too much attention to what they were actually doing, I just played knight a5, which is a very decent move trying to put the knight on the c6 outpost, we still have an absolutely crushing position, but it would have been even better at this point just to play bishop a5 when we are now pinning this and we are going to be winning an exchange and with that probably the game. However, now understanding what both sides are sort of aiming to achieve in the Benko Gambit, now it's really, I think, time for us to dive into like all of the different ideas that are available for both sides in this opening. And the first major thing that I want to discuss are the topic of knight maneuvers in, in the Benko. This is just very common that black likes to play around and full up with their knights, knights are very tricky pieces, and the Benko Gambit is also a tricky opening. And to jump forward a few moves to show what we're talking about, concretely speaking, what squares these knights are going to go to, let's say black castles. After castles, knight b7, let's say, white plays moves such as rook b1, this is actually quite an accurate move, I think, where white tries to go for b3, uh, and then bishop b2, trying to neutralize all the pressure on this diagonal. Not paying too much attention to the concrete details of this position right now, generally speaking, there are a couple of different ways black is going to maneuver around their knights and try to improve them. Uh, one of them is to play knight g4 and then go to e5. I think this is especially common when white has already played e4 and they've, say, weakened uh, some of the light squares in their camp. Here, maybe that effect would not be as pronounced. Another one would be to try and play, say, knight e8 to c7, and then, like, say, b5, or maybe a6, b4, especially if white's already played a4 and weakened the b4 square. And the final one, I guess, we could talk about is maybe black rolling this knight around to b6, the other one to d7, and then maybe infiltrating with to either a4 or c4, and again, sort of poking around uh, in sort of white's camp, not causing a lot of discomfort. And I want to show a small excerpt of a game right now played by a Belarusian grandmaster, Sergei Kasparov, not Gary Kasparov, but Sergei is a very well-known specialist of the Benko Gambit. He even wrote a book on it, I think like a decade or so ago. And in this game, he did something quite interesting where he did not even castle. He instead played this uh, interesting move order of knight fd7. I assume he had some concrete ideas such as stopping like rook 
B1, B3, Bishop B2, which he mentioned earlier. And so after castles, knight B6, rook E1, knight E7, he sort of does that maneuver we talked about earlier, but in a slightly eccentric manner, you could say. And uh, now after E4, castles, Bishop F1. I don't think this was the best way for, for white to play, because if they were going to do this like whole bishop exchange thing, they may as well have done it immediately and then just maneuvered their king around here. But okay, this is what happened. And I, I think it was just white didn't really know what they were doing. But okay, takes, takes. Black moves their queen around, interestingly, to the a6 square. And after king g2, we proceed to a6, queen c2. And in this position, we can really see uh, black completing the knight maneuver we were just talking about earlier by putting it on c4 and in combination with rook fb8 coming next again this is a very uncomfortable position for white to play uh in the game they tried to play b3 to kick the knight out but this is a very common mistake that happens a lot in the benko gambit where a knight pops up here b3 and of course it always depends on the concrete circumstances of the exact position but if you'd like to try and figure out what black can do here to concretely punish this last move i suggest you pause the video and having a little bit of a crack at this position. But that being said, the, the correct idea here that black can pursue is not moving the knight, but instead counterattacking the knight on c3. There's no real good way for white to protect it. The bishop goes to e3 squares, gets captured, a rook pops up here, captured. So what happened in the game was, well, uh, knight a4, but then after takes, takes, and a couple of exchanges, bishop coming back, black was just up a clear exchange. Okay, white had a pawn for it as well, but probably not what white had dreamed of the the night before and of course if after queen a5 just b takes e4 like the whole point is that uh, i'm not sure about bishop takes d3 you might have to be careful here because then there's going to be bishop d2 and you can't take because uh, bishop takes a5 but i imagine if you go queen takes e3 first and uh now attack this and this they kind of have to do that and uh well then you're going to be losing an exchange and with that probably the game also if you go bishop h6 intermediate move I'm pretty sure this is not a big deal because we just move it out of the way and uh, you still have two rooks hanging at the same time. But okay, coming back to again, another very standard looking position for the Benko Gambit in this game, E4 was played. And I want to talk about the theme in this one of the so-called Benko Endgame. I'm not sure if that's an official term, but it's one I'm going to use to describe the types of positions that can occur in the Benko Gambit when queens are exchanged and how this is actually very often something that black does not mind and in fact often very tries to seek which is strange when you consider the fact that you know we are down a pawn and presumably when you are down material you do not want to exchange pieces especially queens yet in the binko gamba i am saying that that is something that we do not mind and in fact uh, are happy to see happen and to illustrate this concept i actually took a game played by what many would regard as the creator of this opening uh paul benko he is the hungarian american grandmaster and okay when this game was played the theory wasn't as developed and hashed out as these days but still we can learn a lot by looking at some of these older games so okay why it goes for a slightly uh, unconventional approach in this game instead of going for the more quick g3 king g2 he goes for uh this long path but okay this is what happens king g1 and instead of going for, for knight bd7 knight a6 played this is also an acceptable way of developing the knight uh queen b6 rook fb8 and uh, we see this knight transfer to c7 as we talked about in the last part this knight could be coming to b5 trying to like exchange itself off and uh like open this diagonal for the bishop when this knight gets removed there right which would presumably again help us increase the pressure on the queen side but okay in the game uh knight c4 was played queen a6 some normal looking moves and in this position benko decide to play knight e5 and again if you are under this assumption that you know trading queens trading pieces and i mean okay you don't want to trade all the pieces of the board because then it's just a winning point in game for white but if you were just under this automatic assumption that you know trading queens that's that's not a good thing we're, we're down a pawn we can't be doing that you are going to be missing out on a lot of benefits of playing this opening and say after what happened in the game knight takes e5 uh f4 bishop d4 bishop c1 basically what had to happen with this move was they had to defend b2 because it's now sort of unprotected and the reason by the way b3 could not be played was because of a very typical benko tactic actually where now if you notice the position it looks like white is sort of holding things together but unfortunately their position collapses after rook takes b3 making use of the loose rook on a1 and after takes takes material is equal but this is actually very typical for a benko endgame again of this sort of position where material balance is equal that 
is actually black who is better because notice this very characteristic thing of the Binko where we have this one nice pawn chain that's very solid whereas white pawns okay they have this one pawn island and then the second one so it might not seem too bad because it's just like one pawn island difference right but not only that just notice how their pawns are more sort of like overextended because of the way they played the opening there wasn't anything inherently wrong with that it just meant that if an end game were to arise that might be something that's sort of playing against them. Which is why in the game, uh, you know, why I tried to play bishop c1, try and hold the material balance together, but still this was a difficult position for them to really handle. Uh, we exchange the queens, and you know, again, if you were of the mindset that, you know, I can't exchange queens, I'm down material, you might play a move like queen a5, which is not a bad move, it's not at all. But queen takes e2 just really... Uh, captures the essence of the position a lot better we're not afraid of a queen exchange we're in fact very willing and sort of again seeking this arrangement you may be able to call it where after rook takes e2 uh, we play king f8 and after knight d1 a bit of a passive move black now really strikes when the iron is hot they play f5 and you know we're saying that like okay you know this is cool the queen side stuff but we don't just have to play over there we can also sort of play more in the center the king side you can call it and with f5 the idea is essentially that after takes takes well you're gonna have a tough time holding this d5 pawn together if you had a pawn still on f2 maybe it wouldn't be so bad because you can play f3 and sort of hold the pawn structure together but unfortunately in this position that's not the case after takes takes d5 is very weak pretty much impossible to stop white from taking that if you protect it we're gonna take this and then take that and this is a very interesting position because again even though the material is technically equal black has the, the way i like to think of it is we have the benko pressure on the queen side plus we now have equal material and like all these pawns that are going to be absolutely ramming white in the center making their life an absolute living hell so in the game benko's opponent tried to play this but it wasn't much use and eventually after e5 his position was completely crushing and Benko without a doubt uh, went on to win the game. Again just to show another quick example of the Benko endgame so to speak we have this position where you know clearly we have a lot of pressure on the queen side why you know their, their life isn't going very well right now so in the game they tried to play rook d3 and hold things together and here black played a bit of a counterintuitive looking move they played bishop takes d3 but very often this is a move we're willing to play giving up our very strong dark with bishop if it means we're going to win a pawn or back two and really, you, you know, just destroy white on the queen side. Obviously, you cannot play pawn takes because then we're going to win the rook. If you say play rook takes, well, you know, we can't play rook takes a2 because our knight's going to hang on c4. But what we can do, I believe, is play knight a3 forking these two pieces. Again, pawn takes, rook hangs. And if you instead take the rook, well, again, same issue. I, I take here first and then I take on b1 and this is completely and other we winning for black. So that's why in this particular game, again, this is actually another game of uh, Benko's, his opponent played queen takes e3, uh, but unfortunately after rook takes a2, this arrives in endgame, may look like it is equal in material, no big issue, or at least like white is, you know, in it for a fighting chance, but unfortunately we know how difficult these endgames actually are for white to hold, and after b3, knight a3, another pair of pieces gets exchanged, but still uh, that doesn't really help make things any easier because uh, c4 is coming on the next move and basically both of these rooks are sort of being targeted and uh, you know white tried to play rook e3 but after c4 they, they still can't take because this one's hanging king e2 and um you know we actually delayed taking the pawn on b3 for quite a while we decided to, to bring the king in a little bit white finally just could not you know stand there still any longer and now we talk and they tried to give some checks didn't lead anywhere though and uh, in this position, they resigned. Talking about some of the, the pawn breaks though in the position that black can pursue, and also we're going to talk about some of the pawn breaks that white can pursue. While it is very often in the Benko that, you know, you can actually just sort of leave these pawns on their, you know, like normal squares for pretty much the whole game and just, you know, absolutely tear white apart with just your piece pressure. There are times where you might also want to use your pawns a little bit to sort of enhance the flavor of the position a little bit. But okay, in this game, what we see white play is bishop f1. Uh, not such a great move but okay sometimes people play because they try to exchange the bishops but again like if you're going to do this why not play e4 here i don't know but these are also some older games where you know the theory wasn't maybe as well established as it is these days but okay we see e4 takes takes a very typical knight maneuver we briefly talked about earlier but now we're seeing it in action knight g4 the knight comes to e5 takes takes king g2 and now we reach a position where you know stuff is pretty well placed but there is that question of how do we continue from now 
you know, we might go for, say, knight c4. This looks interesting. Again, of b3, we have this tactical ball, I think, of queen a5, which looks quite good. Another approach is to also use a pawn break available in the position you could call it with c4. And in this position, it just works very well. Sometimes you have to be a little bit careful of the drawbacks of doing so. I'll show you an example soon of how maybe it could backfire. But in this position, it works very well. Black isn't, you know, very active because they wasted a bunch of time earlier, you know, moving their pieces twice and, you know, using the king to like recapture a piece, which maybe they shouldn't have been exchanging off in the first place. But in this position after c4, basically, what's the idea? Well, we're going to put our knight on an even more active square than c4, the d3 one, where it is also uh, protected by the pawn on c4, making it a very nice outpost. And in this particular game, white didn't pull up very good resistance. Uh, black just sort of kept hammering down their position. We could even consider taking here and doubling the, the e pawns. That looks quite tempting, but okay, in this particular game, uh, black refrained from doing so. They played bishop f6, uh, started infiltrating with their pieces, infiltrated for their queen as well. Um, and pretty much we reached a breaking point where, you know, white was no longer able to handle the pressure in their position. There's just all these pieces attacking from all sorts of angles. They go knight b5, but of course, uh, the, the pawn hangs in b2. And with that, we can pretty much conclude that, yeah, black has a winning position. However, the c4 break doesn't necessarily just have to be about sort of getting the knight onto the d3 square, for example. It can also be about breaking down white structure when they have a pawn on b3. This game was played by Paul Benko, and we see the following maneuver, very typical, and after bishop d2, what Benko does is he decides to play this move c4. And the game continued, rook h c1, takes, takes, and now essentially what's important to understand is that when you break this pawn structure down from two pawns uh, to one like this, this pawn's going to be a lot easier to gain up on and put positional pressure on in the long term, which means black has pretty much full compensation in its position naturally after queen b4. Uh, the game was agreed in a draw after rook takes c2, presumably because after some further exchanges like this, rook b8 is very likely that we're going to be winning back the pawn on b3. But to examine some slightly more critical looking options, say for example b4, because it's important to understand, like in this position, right, if white can play b4, a4, and now get these two protected pass pawns, that's going to be quite bad for us. But fortunately in this concrete position, what black can do is stop the pawn from getting to a4 and go rook a3, which sort of disconnects these pawns in the way, and now means after we bring the other rook here, we're very likely going to take, sacrifice the bishop in order to win the a2 pawn. And again, if we can equalize the material, that's probably going to be a pretty good position for us. Also, it's worth examining, like, if they you know, don't push the pawn, they don't, you know, keep the tension if they take. Uh, again, very often we can't just take this because our queen's hanging, but we can play queen d4. And despite the fact in this position that black is two pawns down, we are going to be winning one pawn back at the very least on the next move. And after that, we are still going to remain like very, very active with all our piece activity. For example, after rook takes e4, knight e5 could be coming in, or rook to a3 even. There's so many things that we can do to the point that, yeah, I just wouldn't be worried about this position at all, really. However, again, I always encourage showing examples where things go wrong so you can understand, like, when maybe an idea isn't so good. And in this position, you know, compared to some of the other ones, I feel like white has stuff a lot more under control. They're a lot better coordinated in general, so it isn't much of a surprise that c4, as was played in this game between two amateur players, but it sort of backfired and didn't work very well after, say, rook d1, when in the game black played knight g4, but just to show, like, say, knight c5, which is another very natural looking move. There's sort of two problems with this. One is that c4 is actually sort of overextended, so black, sorry, white rather might just be able to attack it very directly, and it's not so easy to actually protect the pawn. For example, if you just go queen a6, I don't really think this does much because after knight d2 that the pawn is going to drop which is why the engine actually suggests something like knight b3 and just sort of like non-stop harassing the the rooks by moving the knight back and forth and there still is compensation but obviously when you're two pawns down that becomes a little bit more sketchy but another approach is also to just play knight d4 uh and in general you can notice like the, the big theme is that when the pawn moves to c4 is that it, it weakens the d4 square and last piece is in there, and now I can I come to c6, b5 maybe, the other one could come there. And it might still sort of look good for black, even after knight d3, but unfortunately, uh, this is actually, could not be further from the truth. And after knight c6, let's say rook b7, because the rook was under attack, and also it sort of defends the pawn now, well, white can actually sacrifice the exchange, rook takes d3, takes, takes, and uh, now what we see is white is technically down in exchange, but they have two pawns for it. So material is technically equal, but the position is basically lost for black because these pawns are just going to roll forward. These knights are very strong. 
and there's not really a damn thing the black can do about it. Another major pawn break in the Benko Gambit, however, would occur on the other side of the board where, let's say, we take the following game played between, again, two players right around 2000. In this game, Bishop F1 is weird, trying to trade off the white squared bishops, whether that's beneficial or not is maybe up for debate. But essentially, now what is uh, basically going on in this position is if you really look at the circumstances, uh, you know, with white on the king side, you will notice that they don't have a lot of pieces really defending things over there. And uh, so our eyes are probably going to immediately be drawn to, okay, ideas like 93, of course, this is something we should be thinking about. But on a more macro sort of view of things, uh, an idea which you should really be trying to think about is, can we play a move such as f5? And in this position, this is very strong, where so let's say after e takes f5, for example, rook takes f5, uh, you know, this is sort of under threat, maybe not immediately, because there's, of course, the x-ray and the queen, but like knight d3 also attacks f2, we can be doubling up here, uh, maybe queen a6 and then rook takes d5, sorry, knight takes d5 rather. Also say, for example, like white plays queen takes f1, this is a bit more of a, a sensible move, uh, we can play queen a6, once again, trying to get the Benko endgame, which we've talked a lot about, and if they, like, I don't know, try to avoid that, now we can go f5 as per usual. One reason we might not want to go f5 in this exact position is a bit more concrete, let's say, we're after, I think, a3 it was. We might run into some concrete issues with, say, like, uh, knight a6, b4, and again, if white gets these queenside pawns running, that can be a little bit of a problem. Uh, the, the issue is that if we just take a bunch of times, then there's going to be a, a knight hanging on a6. But again, I don't want to get too bogged down into the exact, you know, tactical details of this very unique position, uh, but you do want to keep in mind the idea of f5, sometimes it can work very well. However, if we take a look at this position in comparison to the last one we just looked at, there are quite a few differences, I would say, in this position, namely that there's a lot more pieces on the board, pretty much nothing has been traded off yet, it's very tense, and in the game what Black tried to do this time was in service day going for knight g5 or like rook b8, you get kicked away and then knight e5, which looks pretty sensible and in line with normal Benko play, uh, Black got very optimistic in this game and they tried to go for this very forward lunge with uh, knight d5 and White was like, okay, well, let me try and exploit the fact that now this knight's a little bit awkward because, you know, normally the knight would want to jump from g4 to e5, but this knight has been a bit of a wanker and he's occupying that square. So let me let those guys fight it out a little bit. I'm just going to step back and try and go for, say, like a3, f4 next. And, you know, black didn't really see a problem. They just continued forward, you know, with their break which they planned which is f5 unfortunately the issue in this position was these pieces were sort of stepping over each other's toes and that they could just get kicked back too easily with moves like a3 f4 and now to really show the, the big picture issue after like say b3 again knight b6 was it after e5 when if we really just take a step back and sort of observe what happened over the last few moves basically we played f5 provoked wide in the center we expected them maybe to take or something that didn't happen instead they kicked us around a few moves advance forward and they made use of a lapse in our coordination which was that we can't really win the pawn back because unfortunately our knight is going to be hanging on h6 and if we can't you know win that pawn back unfortunately like say as what happened in the game with our queen b8 knight f3 they're just going to consolidate their extra pawn and basically have a very very big positional advantage Discussing, however, probably the last important pawn break that I think that is important to keep in mind when playing the Benko, it is probably somewhat of a, maybe you could say last resort, but interesting third option that Black has very often when playing these positions, which, again, this was actually a game played by Paul Benko, and Paul Benko, when he played the Benko, he... Uh, I'm saying Benko on what I know, but he, he very much actually, from what I noticed, liked to play this pawn break, but these days it's a little bit less seen than, say, when he was originally sort of toying around figuring out the, the opening. But basically, uh, the idea, like, this all looks pretty normal so far, we attack the d5 pawn, so white sort of, you know, wants to defend it, uh, we, we make an exchange quite happily, and, you know, we have like what looks like a pretty normal Benko Gambit procedure so far in the game, except now Paul decides to break away from the structure, which is very familiar to many Benko players, and really make the game more dynamic by playing this move e6. Challenging the d5 pawn, and very often what's going to happen is, you know, I could maybe play something like queen d3 and try to keep the tension, but I actually doubt this is much good because let's say like in this position, for example, we can take here and then like, we do give up the darkswood bishop, of course, but 
uh, I think it is undeniable that there are some clear benefits to uh, winning DeFi pawn, and as long as white doesn't have any like direct threats against our king, I think they were actually doing quite well, not to mention that like if they move the bishop, which we're probably going to take if we get the chance to, then we can take on A2, and like now we're actually a pawn up. But okay, in the, in the game, and usually what happens, or at least the most principled response, generally speaking to E6, I feel like, is for white to take, and because Benko's done this H6 stuff earlier, we can in G6, we probably don't want to take this feels very risky. Risky. maybe they're going to play e5 and open this diagonal up really hitting the soft spot of g6 which was why in the game knight takes e6 was played sort of hinting at the idea that maybe we want to play knight d4 and infiltrate into white's camp and do some tricky stuff uh d5 was played now and uh we got a lot of counterplay here with achieving knight d4 eventually c takes d4 and while again we still are a pawn down by changing up the structure we've achieved a, a very powerful pass d pawn in the center we still have this sort of pressure going on the queen side as well which is everlasting the benko gambit very often so just keep in mind this idea right of going e6 sometimes probably isn't something that you should default to every game but there are certain positions like this one where if you feel like your opponent isn't very well coordinated to sort of handle the, the e6 break this is an idea that you might want to be looking out for talking about some of white's pawn breaks now because again you know you can't just be thinking about like what am i going to do you also have to be thinking about how am i going to deal with what my opponent's going to do so i want to talk about you know like these positions very often where say white puts a pawn on e4 and they try to break through e5 now, very often when they have a pawn e4, they, they don't necessarily break with e5 because very often there's a sort of risk associated with you're going to like overextend a little bit. You, you don't really just want to exchange like your, your e pawn for the d6 one. That's not really a life goal of white. Usually white wants to make sure if they're going to break through with e5 that they're achieving something very concrete. But okay, I think it's very important that we know how to deal with this and well in this game between two 2200-ish players, knight c4 was played, very typical, sort of putting uh, pressure onto the b2 pawn. And in the game, uh, white just ignores this, they played e5. And what you do not want to do in this position is you do not want to take on e5 because if you think about it again, like you have this one pawn island here, by playing d takes e5, you sort of break it up right now. This is two pawn islands after knight takes e5, takes, takes. Uh, if we look at who has benefited from this transformation, there's definitely white, white retains their advantage of being a pawn up, there's also the weak c5 pawn now, uh, their bishop is sort of nullifying our one in this diagonal, so that's not very fun, and like all in all, there's at this point in time nothing really good to say about black's position anymore, which of course uh, is not a good thing, so we need to come back to this position and figure out, like, if we're not going to take, what are we going to do? And in this specific game, what Black resolved to was uh, this move knight h5, which I think is a very playable option, combating the bishop on the square. Uh, if they move away, then, of course, we are going to, like, you know, win a pawn, and that's pretty good. So what ended up happening was they, they just gave up on trying to keep the bishop. They played queen c2, and after the following, like, Black had pretty good compensation when you take into account the fact that you know, white sort of ruined their pawn structure a little bit. We have the bishop here now, and the, the game ultimately ended up in a draw. But even better is arguably to play something like knight g4, directly pressuring the e5 pawn. And it's worth understanding, right, that we're always happy to see something like take just releasing the tension, because after, you know, we take back, we can put a knight on e5, establish it there, and, you know, things are going pretty well. And we even have something better in this position, because uh, b2 is hanging, so we can go like knight takes b2, and like knight d3, and do all sorts of wild stuff remember that you know the rook's actually protecting this so we're not losing material and for that reason we're, we're doing quite well but of course the, the point to remember is if you don't have a good reason to take on e5 you probably shouldn't however this position is an example where e5 was played and it was actually a lot more acceptable to take on e5 because after the following exchange right notice how it is a rook not a bishop that lands on e5 and so for that reason the rook is sort of standing in the eye of our bishop which can create a lot of potential troubles uh very soon let's say after like queen a8 queen f3 rook d8 we even got a pressure on the d5 pawn also because they they don't have their light good bishop like they did in the other example protecting this one and so a logical sequence may be something such as rook b1 knight g4 and let's say knight e5, queen d1, and again borrowing another idea that we looked at earlier, c4, knight e3, and again black is a very good position. Another pawn break which I'm not sure it's super dangerous, but nonetheless you have to be watching out for occasionally, and can be scary from what I've talked to for a couple uh, students of mine that play the Benko Gambit, which is, you know, what happens if, if white just starts rolling their h pawn down the board? And this is especially prevalent when uh, black moves the, the f6 knight, as we often do in this opening, say we move it more towards the queen side, because if it just stays on f6 forever, well, h4, h5, we're just going to take off the knight, and we're not particularly scared of it. 
So I call, okay, like knight e8 for example, rook d1, knight e7. And notice once this knight was well away from the king's side, in this game white decided to pursue his interesting idea by going h4. And to be honest, objectively speaking, in this exact position, I wouldn't say it is too dangerous, like for example, we could just stop the pawn with h5, or maybe we could play uh, h6 and meet h5 with g5, and sometimes you have to watch out for sacrifices in g5, but here I don't think it's a big deal, mainly because, you know, white's pieces are all sort of hovered around the queen side, they're so far away from the action. But to just demonstrate how, like, you know, there are some dangers in this position, like if we just sort of let white steamroll ahead, like this position got pretty bad pretty quickly, I won't explain too many of these moves, but you'll be able to recognize very quickly, like once we get to this sort of point, right, like, uh, the rook is on h1, the queen is right, maybe it's going to cross something like g4, queen c3 check, and then jump into c3, sorry, h3 rather. This really is not what we dreamed of when we played the Benko Gambit at all. We're supposed to be playing on the queen side, but nothing really much has happened over there, and white is actually sort of killing us on the king side. But just to give a bit of a contrasting example to the last one, in this position, black actually is better off just simply letting white steamroll their pawn ahead, and just pursuing counterplay on the queen side with something like knight f4, trying to eliminate this knight on c3. Uh, we saw in the game, it's actually worked out quite well after b3. Again, we go for the Benko endgame. Uh, takes takes happened and uh, given this rook was under attack and e5 doesn't really block it because then the, the pawn on d5 would hang they played rook c1 but we equalized the material and this position is not really an issue at all for black but coming back to this position right i think it's worth talking about this a little bit more and some of black's options such as h6 and h5 and h5 like there's no clear reputation of the engine doesn't like it as much and I mean, again, that's probably due to the fact that these pieces are more centrally located to near Black's king. And in particular, h6 is where we see like the concept of, you know, white pieces being in close proximity to our king really kicking in because after h5, g5, now sacrifices like bishop takes g5 really do sort of kick us in the arse a little bit because they can say play after h takes g5, something like e5 to open the queen's diagonal up and after takes, knight takes g5 and, and these threats are really scary to deal with. Like, queen coming to h7, I can't draw arrows, but uh, queen h7, h6, and we're doing pretty well. But the sort of final pawn break I really want to talk about from White's perspective is probably this a4 one, and earlier, I think especially in the intro, I sort of talked about how this one is probably, like, from a theoretical point of view, quite, uh, quite difficult to deal with. Many people have also called this a sort of refutation of the Benko Gambit, and I will admit it is quite strong. Depending on your level, you may or may not see this quite a bit. And the basic idea, again, of why it is so strong, if you remember, I showed this nightmare earlier position, and this is something to clearly avoid, so just to show how we actually ended up here, uh, in the game Black played Queen A5, which is quite a poor move because what essentially does is steps right into White's idea which is that they're going to put a, a knight on b5 and combine it with a bishop coming here. If you play rook fb8 well then your queen went to a5 for what reason it's not very clear because it's going to have to step back on the very next move and then like bishop c3 and not only did we get our knight to a, a nice outpost but we also have used our bishop uh, at the same time to sort of neutralize our, our opponent's bishop. I think that move order is slightly inaccurate because of course here we are just hanging the e4 pawn, but if we instead uh, take a little bit of a time out, go queen c2 and then bishop c3, uh, just to show one nice example of how play may continue, I've had this pattern quite a lot where I go c3, uh, knight c7, let's say uh, we can take here first, I think is more appropriate, takes, takes, and quite a nice idea that white can pursue is putting a knight on d4 and then putting on either b5 or c6, whatever the position calls for. And notice, of course, how black not take because the, the queen is going to hang. So in this game, what the opponent tried was a bit of a sneaky try by playing queen b4, which very often happens in the bank code, but in this position doesn't really work because we can just ignore it, actually. And after queen takes b2, the whole idea is uh, rook fb1 and knight e1, the queen is trapped, so uh, they, they actually ran backwards with the queen on the next move. Rook hb1, and I was able to establish, again, this very dominant setup, where uh, also notice this is a very common idea. Uh, instead of just exchanging here, if white did that, that would sort of play into to black's hands. Instead, we make use of, again, the fact that these knights are sort of stepping on each other's toes, and we're just going to kick the, them back. And uh, actually, this knight has no available squares at the moment, which is why uh, black played f6 to create a room for it. But of course, uh, the, the consequence of this is just you're, you're very passive in the horizon position. So one suggestion I, I have for you guys uh, to sort of make life a little bit more tricky for the, the white player is to delay the development of the knight on d7 in this exact position actually 
and make it so that when white plays a4 now, we're actually going to go for knight a6 instead of putting the knight on d7. Making use, of course, of the fact that pawns do not move backwards, so the knight's going to have this nice outpost on b4, and then we sort of continue from there, putting the rook on b8 maybe, after knight becomes b5, we go like knight e8, knight c7 maybe. And while the engine still, you know, will say that white probably has some sort of advantage here, at least I think from a practical perspective, it makes it a lot more difficult and sort of takes the white player out of their comfort zone a little bit. Alright, so jumping into the second part of this video now, we are going to be talking about the so-called declined lines, I'd like to call them, where basically... Uh, white decides to not take on b5 but instead just keep the tension and this brings about many different possibilities because of course if white does not take our b5 pawn well then maybe we can take white c4 pawn maybe we can advance it and maybe we can even just keep the tension and try and play a move such as g6 hoping that eventually white is going to actually take on b5 and go into maybe some more accepted type lines. But to start off, I want to talk about when should black take on c4? When does it make sense to play the seemingly natural capture? And generally speaking, what I've observed is it tends to make a lot of sense when white plays moves such as either queen c2 or let's say knight d2, when in either one of these situations, you can see that white sort of cuts off their uh, defense from d5 pawn a little bit. And this is important because generally speaking, I'll follow up in these sorts of situations when white is going to play e4, of course reinforcing the d5 pawn and now threatening to take back the c4 one on the next move. The way we're going to usually want to respond is again to try and undermine the d5 point by playing e6. And say for example, we try to do this exact same thing where white plays a more flexible move such as knight f3, we take on c4 here. This is generally not regarded to be so good because if we take a say similar line where knight c3 happens, e6, e4, white has a very firm grip in the center, they're going to play bishop takes c4 next, they have pretty much perfectly placed pieces and if we play e takes d5, then e5 is a very strong move we have to contend with because wherever the knight moves next is going to be queen takes d5. And if you'd like to try and figure out why d4 does not work in this position, counterattacking our opponent's knight, I suggest you pause the video uh, as a nice little small, small calculation exercise. Uh, but that being said, the, the reason why is because after d4, we have this very thematic tactic of e takes f6, d takes e3, and queen e2 check, when black has to block uh, this check, of course, but they are going to be losing a piece in doing so. But coming back to one of the most common lines in the Benko decline, where white goes knight f3, uh, in this game it occurred by a slightly different move order, with white playing knight f3 on move 2, and then after the following moves they play c4, which isn't exactly the most popular approach, Typically, if white gets to this exact position, the most popular one is to play bishop g5 and sort of uh, refrain from touching the c-pawn for a while. And this takes a lot of sting out of the, the b5 move, actually, and it's for this reason that typically against 2 knight free move order, I'm not a big fan of going c5, but this is going to have to be a bit of a topic for uh, another video, I'm afraid. However, the concept I want to talk about in this small segment is the b5 to b4 push for black. We talked about how b takes c4 is not so good in this position. It is playable for black to play a, a move such as bishop b7 though, I think this might even be one of the best options that black has in this position. Keeping the tension a little bit and say if something like, I don't know, queen c2 in this position, uh, now again we can take and try to undermine this center with something like e6 and I think we have a pretty decent play here. But okay, definitely a very interesting option that white possesses, sorry, black rather possesses in this position is to, to play b4 and the engines tend to like this option a lot because it gains space and engines like space. It also takes away the c3 square for the knight to develop to, and you could imagine, let's say, going for a more conventional Benko move order, if white were to play knight c3 here, for example, well, this obviously is not going to be so great, but uh, this knight is basically just inviting b4 to come with tempo in this sort of scenario, right, where also another typical line where they're sort of asking for b4 to be played as a4, where they're exerting a lot of pressure on b5, we're not going to be able to keep the tension here, we're either going to have to, like, you know, do one of these things, doesn't really make sense uh, to take the a4 pawn, and this one feels positionally uh, not as great, because we're sort of exchanging a, a more central pawn for a more sort of flank pawn, if that makes sense. So definitely the most principled option in this position is to go b4, again, gain space, and you know, especially in these sorts of situations, right, where there's a decision being forced upon us that we need to make, it, it makes a lot of sense just to go for b4. But okay, coming back to like this other position we were just talking about, I think it is rather telling that the engine, even in these positions where there's not this extra pressure and sort of like a gun to our heads so to speak forcing us to make a decision to do something with this pawn i think it is telling that even here the engine likes this move b4 and even though again this sort of goes against the grain of how the benko player likes to play with all these open lines on the queen side if you don't mind more of a closed game i definitely think this is sort of a possibility you can think about in various lines as well as like say the queen c2 one we looked at earlier 
B takes E4, you know, very principled, but even B4 is quite decent here. But just to show one illustrative game of how play may proceed, we, we play in, you know, very typical developing style for how we do in the Benko, except for the fact that we don't have the ability to utilize any open files because there are none, but rather we might push our queenside pawns, try to open some lines if possible. H6G5 happened here to sort of try and exploit the, the dark sword bishop, which is uh, come outside and continuing to follow how the game proceeded here we eventually played a3 and just notice how our dark sword bishop even though it's not quite attacking anything it does have very nice command over the dark squares in white's territory and after bishop c3 queen e3 we didn't choose to win an exchange because that would potentially give white a lot of counter chances on the king side so instead of the game a, a tricky move knight df6 was played relocating the knight more towards the king side but another interesting move which i think packs a lot of venom is this move knight g7 preparing f5 when i think that white is really under a lot of pressure in this position to round out though what is a relatively short section on these decline lines i want to talk about this move b3 very shortly though this is a line which objectively if you switch the engine on it, it's not very good at all i think it even says black is slightly better in these positions however if you go to play the benko online what you will find is that you play against a lot of people who are not maybe as booked up as actual tournament players and that they for some reason play this move b3 quite a lot and while i understand the logic where you want to reinforce the, the pawn on c4 with another pawn but the problem is objectively speaking it's just very slow and doesn't pose any problems to, to black at all. I want to show a brief game quickly played by uh, Paul Benko. His opponent didn't play it the best way in this game possible. But nonetheless, it just shows to get a good position against this line. You don't need to do anything special. You can take here. You can also keep the tension, but taking is very simple. D6, very typical developed moves. In this game, White tried to play very ambitiously with F3. Of course, we go E4 immediately while well, we just take it. So they want to build up the pawn center, uh, but they don't want to allow now to take E4, so they do this. But... This is a bit over ambitious, I think, for their whole uh, B3 setup. The, these sort of combination of moves, I think, don't go very well together. But okay, nonetheless, this is what we saw. F3 here, knight d7, e4, rook b8, queen c2, queen a5. And as you can probably notice, the queen side play that black is generating is uh, very dangerous for white to deal with. And they couldn't really cope with it actually very well in the game at all because they played king f2. But unfortunately, after this very nice blow, knight takes e4 check. The idea being that, you know, if queen takes e4, rook takes b2, Knight takes e4, again rook takes b2, and so that more or less leaves f takes e4, but unfortunately after rook takes b2, queen takes b2, takes uh, the queen move somewhere. Black could choose to finish the sequence off with bishop takes a1 and remain a piece up. However, in the game decide to be much more ambitious, played knight f6, and basically just go for the white king, and it basically worked very well. They uh, decide to now finally win the exchange back, but now instead of being one pawn up, they are two pawns up, and you can be sure the Benko did not fail uh, to convert this lovely position. So now getting into the third part of this video, I want to talk about the partially accepted lines, many of which are probably not as critical as, again, the very main accepted lines, where white grabs every pawn that they can in sight but nonetheless you still need to know what you're doing against and if you don't know what you're doing against as we're going to see throughout the segment can actually become quite dangerous and probably the first one that i think is worth mentioning is probably the b6 one this is known as the pawn return variation i think i've heard but nonetheless i want to give you guys two sorts of different approaches you can play in this position one is arguably a bit more in the style of the benko gambit but probably regarded as by engines and modern theory are uh, not quite as robust and the other one is basically the exact opposite the engines love it modern players love it but it doesn't really fit the mold of what many Benko Gambit players like. But that all being said, the one that many Benko Gambit players are probably going to be drawn to is just playing g6, you know, taking on b6. There is also the line that you can play by playing d6, uh, knight d7, knight takes b6. And of course, it is concretely slightly different to the lines uh, we're going to be looking at in this short segment, but the nature of them remain very much similar. But okay, uh, you can play in this position, queen takes b6. Say the following moves are going to happen. These are very common. Knight d2, castles, bishop e2 it is a slight move order nuance to go knight d2 before playing uh bishop e2 because some people don't like running into the, the pin here with uh, light squared bishops being traded off so that's why here we saw knight d2 castles and we get this order position where basically we have a pawn on a6 whereas typically in the accepted lines uh this pawn does not exist and of course that is sort of a good thing in some ways because it means the material balance is equal however many benko players will secretly wish at night that that pawn was not there and that they could just use it for their heavy pieces to 
do their typical duties on the open files. But okay, how does Black really navigate these sorts of positions? And typically from what I've noticed, at some point what we're going to want to do is either pursue some sort of very direct pie in the center with either like bishop b7, e6, or we're going to go for something more like just playing on the queen side, keeping these pawns sort of at bay, and playing a5, bishop a6, and trying to challenge the light squares on the queen side. However, you have to be very wary when you do this that, you know, you by playing a move such as a5, as happened in this small game I'm going to show here, it does also weaken the b5 square. So white's typically going to play a4, try to implant a piece here. And for a long time, to be honest, before I actually did the research for this video, I kind of always assumed that, like, this sort of position where, you know, black's played a5, white's played a4, that's quite unpleasant. But I actually realized upon analyzing this further that while that can be the case sometimes, it's definitely not that clear cut. And say for example, like if we go bishop a6 here, if white just slams the bishop onto the b5 square, that it isn't that easy for white to actually keep their control over the, the square. For example, after uh, takes takes, one nice idea is to play queen b7 as a slight prophylactic move. Uh, sort of preventing knight c4 coming with tempo. Now they can't really play this at the moment because knight takes e4 is going to hang a pawn. So maybe white's going to go say like queen c2 for example. Uh, knight b6 is an idea. Say rook b1 trying to prepare like b3 bishop b2 gain the rook off this diagonal. Uh, a very typical maneuver which we can pursue is knight e8 b3 knight c7. And to be honest I really don't think black is doing that badly at all in these sorts of positions if you really take a moment to observe what's going on. Not to mention even a few moves ago there were some other interesting possibilities like even going f5 because you know white had been playing passively the last moves they sort of lost control of the d5 pointing a little bit and we can use this idea which we uh, talked about earlier again in part one however in this specific game that i had loaded up what white did actually was they played rook a3 keeping the tension a little bit uh bishop e2 happened queen a6 and now the dynamic of course with the benko endgame is a little bit different because you know black doesn't have the open a file so white might have thought the trading queens had let's say fewer drawbacks to it, but still it actually was very difficult to hold this position together and already the computer evaluates this as more than equal for black, which is always good news. Knight b6 happened. White got a piece onto b5 and they thought that, you know, they're doing well because of that. But again, the picture was not that simple. Black brought a knight to e8 and then c7 in very short order. Uh, first of all, we did some zigzagging with our rook, which I have to admit, I haven't quite taken the time to understand, but what we did do is knight c7, uh, rook a8, protecting our other rook here, so that on the next move we can play knight c4 and recapture with our other rook here. And now after b3 takes takes, uh, because it was very difficult for them to hold together this and this, uh, they just got a much worse position, f5 happened, and you know, we can look at the more of the game if we really wanted to, but I think there's no need to at this point. Uh, the evaluation is clearly the black is better. Another nice game which I thought I should show you guys in this uh, more Benko type line was played by Anish Giri actually when he was much younger. At the time of this game, he was rated 2400 it says, and we reached to the other position which we just got to, but this time uh, Anish and serve what we saw in the other game uh, where black played a5, played the more uh, respectable queen c7 I believe, where the idea is basically to avoid getting hit uh, with knight c4 with tempo, and now you want to meet knight c4 with knight b6, and typically white's going to play something like knight e3 because uh, trading pieces only really helps black's matter. But in this game what we saw in serve knight c4 I think is a slightly more critical a4, and Anish put into action this idea we were just talking about with bishop b7, a5, e6, putting a lot of pressure onto white's center, and the concrete idea which really makes this whole thing work is that we're not going to take on d5 here because I think after just e takes d5, bishop f4, there's actually a lot of pressure on black's position. But the Anish's point and one that's being played a fair bit in this position already is to play knight takes e4 so that after knight takes e4, d takes e4, you're going to be wanting one of the pieces back. And very precisely, I should mention after knight e takes d6, uh, black is not going to be taken back immediately because in this position, I think we are losing an exchange. But rather what you are going to do instead is to play bishop c6 and uh, notice how both of these knights are sort of hanging at the same time. So black is going to win back their piece and basically have a fine position. However, as I said, I am also going to cover a second option, which is maybe one that I would play myself. I had this position, which is to play e6, immediately counterattacking white's d5 point. And we shouldn't really be scared of takes because we just take back towards the center. We're going to play d5. And this is sort of like a Blumenfeld gambit, actually. The Blumenfeld, by the way, is the opening which occurs in this position after e6. Uh, and now after c5, d5, b5. And if, you know, white takes the pawns a bunch of times, white goes d5 basically and amasses this sort of nice pawn center. But I would say it's probably even better in this position because there's a pawn on b6, which we can probably have up grabs at any time we want. 
So, okay, that's white in this position. Typically, white keeps attention. They play knight c3. Uh, black exchanges a bunch of times after queen takes d5, knight c6. And if white isn't very precise and they just play e4, you know, we're probably just doing fine after the following moves. Queen takes b6, d6, bishop e6, maybe a knight coming to b4 at some point. We haven't got a counterplay and there's nothing really to worry about. So typically a more precise move order, which I don't know how many of your opponents are actually going to play, is to play knight f3. And the whole point is that now if you play a bit of a lazy move, bishop e7, white has a very precise reply, knight e5. The idea being they're attacking f7, they're also attacking this, and of course if you take it, you're going to hang the rook here. Which is why the, the more precise one is considered to be rook b8, and if this is already sort of, you know, feeling a bit over your head, overly complicated, then again, maybe you want to go for the g6 approach where there's not really any force theory, so to speak, like there are some concrete ideas, but you definitely don't have to be so accurate early on with the, the moves you play, whereas in this line there is some accuracy required. But okay, rook b8 happens, e4, and then we go for bishop e7, bishop c4, castle, castle, and now we want to go rook takes b6 and I would say these positions are relatively okay again we want to go for d6 uh, maybe bishop e6 put a bishop on this diagonal and I don't really think there's too much to complain about in this position for the black pieces however in addition to the fully accepted line the line we're going to be talking about now is probably one of the other main critical lines of the Benko Gambit these days which is the rather innocuous looking move e3 where white just simply protects the b5 pawn and again talking about what happens if black just sort of you know tries to keep the tension displays g6 hoping that white eventually takes on a6. I would say that this one is actually quite dangerous for black if they don't know what they're doing. I'm not sure if I'd say it's refuted, but just to give an example of something that we want to avoid, uh, white's going to typically play a4, uh, reinforcing the pawn on b5. We're going to see how this becomes relevant soon. Let's say we have some moves such as following, bishop d2, uh, a very important move actually if the queen protecting the rook. Now, knight e8, let's say black wants to try play the knight around c7, which is a typical idea we've talked about previously. Uh, bishop e2, a takes b5, and now black might be expecting white to take on b5 with a knight, maybe a bishop, probably a bishop more because uh, knight takes b5 would hang the b2 pawn. But white is going to do neither of those, but instead actually take with the a pawn. And while on the surface level, it may appear that these, you know, double b pawns are not so great for white, they probably we should have, you know, taken with a piece on b5 instead. If you analyze the position deeper, what you'll eventually find out is that this pawn on b5 is basically a big pawn in your ass, and it is very difficult to deal with, which makes this position uh, much better for white, and something which I definitely would not want to play myself. So in this position, there are some slightly more concrete tries, such as like a takes b5, with the idea that after bishop takes b5, queen a5 check, forks uh, the bishop and uh, king, but of course they get knight c3, protect it, but the point is after bishop b7, we again reinforcing the threat. If white just plays uh, bishop c4, trying to deal with both of those at the same time, after e6 they come on the very unpleasant counterplay. For example, bishop d2, queen b6, e4, and again, a very nice tactical bow, knight takes e4, knight takes e4, e takes d5, forking these two pieces, black is already better. However, instead though, uh, what white can do is play bishop d2 with the idea that if knight takes d5, that doesn't quite uh, win material back, because now is going to be this very typical fork uh, of knight c7 check, which means uh, black should then go queen b6 instead, now reinforce this threat, which to be honest, white can't really do anything about at this point, I believe if e4, e6, uh, their center is sort of collapsing, so what they actually let uh, white do in this position after queen b6 is just let them win the pawn back, the whole point is that after knight takes d5, a4, material is equal, maybe you want to play the positions, give this a shot, but it is widely considered that these positions are a bit unpleasant for, for black despite, you know, having these nice central pawns because white just has a lot of peace activity. However, I think there is one interesting line which is a little bit less well known, let's say, and that is picking up some popularity among some players, uh, is this move e6 counterattacking the d5 pawn once again, similar to what we saw in the b6 uh, this line right, where again, uh, we're not so scared of uh, something like this occurring, I feel like we should be quite happy to see some developments like this on the board where we have a nice center, Blumenfeld type compensation. The engines still prefer white definitely a bit here, but I think practically this provides some interesting chances. Uh, but let's say after e3, e6, they play the more logical looking knight c3, keeping the tension in the center. We're going to take on d5 takes, and we're not going to do this whole uh, knight takes d5 thing because after queen takes d5, unlike when the pawn was in b6, we cannot play knight c6, so that doesn't really make much sense to allow. But rather, we're going to play bishop b7, uh, add tension onto this knight. So again, knight takes f6 check, it's more logical, and we get a position like this essentially, which is hopefully going to arise after the following moves. Uh, now a takes b5 makes some sense once they've already developed their bishop, so they have to spend another tempo with it. And now in this position, essentially what black's going to do at some point is play d5, uh, claim that they have a nice center. We can do it immediately, there are some nuances, 
as to why this maybe is not as good as Dwayne, but in practice a lot of people just play it immediately and seem to be having okay results with it. A rook's probably going to come into the center, a knight c6, maybe a bishop's going to switch over around this diagonal as well to help attack over there. And again, I think this sort of position provides a lot of interesting practical chances, while not quite being exactly in the spirit of the Benko, for us to have reasonable optimism going into this. However, talking a little bit about uh, Hans Niemann and his former coach Maxim Dlugi, uh, this variation with f3, a takes b5, e4 is named after him, and it is actually a very tricky variation for black to deal with because uh, there are basically two threats that black has simultaneously deal with. Uh, one is that they're going to try and win back the pawn on the next move, and the other is that white also wants to play e5, kicking our knight back to g8. And while some staunch Benko Gambit players might insist on just playing d6 and sacrificing b5 pawn, I really don't think there's a need to do that, and I think there's a much stronger option in this position to deal with both of these ideas that white has coming at us, which is to play queen a5 check. And now essentially if white, you know, players move like knight e2, we're going to play d6, and we've protected this, and we've also stopped e5. So typically what white is going to do is they're going to play bishop d2 to gain another tempo on our queen. And the usual way to respond to this is to play b4, and again if they, they go e5, knight takes d5, and the queen is not actually hitting the d5 square. So how white usually responds to this is by putting a very nice idea, knight a3, making use of the fact that we can't take it because the knight comes in here. This is all very standard theory. If someone plays uh, this line against you, th they're going to play into this. So just trust me, d6 is what you play, knight t4. And now in my opinion, the best move is to go queen d8. But after the move a3, and again, I know at the start of the video, I did say I'm going to be trying to mostly focus on ideas. But in some positions such as these, we simply cannot help but have to know the very precise uh, move that black has to play, which is to play e6. I once played b takes a3 in an over the board game when I was much younger, and I got absolutely bloody smoked. Uh, this position, believe it or not, after takes, 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 is basically borderline lost for, for black, actually. This is past a pawn, it's very difficult to deal with. White has a lean development, these pieces are going to start like swarming over to the, the queen side, and I really do not want you guys having to deal with this sort of position. It, it is a nightmare. So that is why what you, and by the way, if you are curious about what the engine evaluation is, it is almost past two. So yeah, don't go for this. Instead, what I want you to play in this position is to play e6, counterattacking the center actually now. If they just, you know, mindlessly take, I'm pretty sure we're going to, you know, win back a pawn. So usually what white does in this position is to play d takes e6. Now after bishop takes e6, they go a takes b4. And the way we operate in this position is after these moves to play d5, counterattacking in the center. And black has a lot of counterplay in this position. Typically white's going to want to try and keep lines close with b5. Uh, you can imagine that we're going to get a lot of counterplay in these sorts of positions. So b5 is the most popular move here. Uh, bishop b7 though, you know, some moves like this and maybe knight b4. We have a shit ton of counterplay. Yes, we are technically down a pawn, but white still wasn't complete development. There's of course the threat of knight c2, there's also knight d3 maybe. So all in all, a lot of reason to be optimistic and personally why I am not so afraid again of uh, the Dungugi variation even though I got crushed with it when I was younger because I now know that in this position uh, you do not want to take on a3, you want to play e6 instead, actively counterattacking the center. And to sort of wrap up on these assortment of partially accepted lines, shall we call them, I want to talk about what is known as the, the Zaitsev variation against the Benko, at least that's what apparently it's called on Lee Chess, where white plays knight t3. And the idea of this is that after a takes b5, that you play e4 actually, you do not take the pawn on b5. Uh, if you go knight takes b5, I think that, you know, this is just sort of a, an improved Benko because we've played bishop a6 and gained a tempo. While doing so, white is behind considerably on the normal fully accepted variation. So uh, typically how they're going to operate is to play e4. And this looks very nonsensical because after b4, their, their knight's getting kicked around, but they go knight b5, and this is where you need to be very careful. Uh, you want to make sure in this position you play d6, and uh, the, you do not instead uh, play knight takes e4, because uh, this is actually a very common trap that people have fallen into, where after queen e2, now if you basically move the knight, you, you get mated, and that's not fun. If you try to play f5 and think, haha, no I'm not, well, yes you are, because after f3 unless you want to lose a piece you're going to go back and, and still get mated so again this is going to be one of those unfortunate cases where you're just going to have to remember some concrete moves and okay d6 is not very uh difficult to remember but after bishop f4 uh you want to remember this very precise move g5 and the reason is is that after g6 of course uh, again like the the point of bishop f4 is that pressure is reinforced in the square if you go knight takes e4 uh 
Knight takes d6 is not mate this time, but it's still pretty freaking bad. But you might just think, well, okay, if I can go g6, play bishop g7, develop, the knight on b5 is misplaced, I'm probably going to be better. And that's true, if you can achieve that. The problem, however, is that white is going to be doing their best ability to be an absolute pain in the ass. They're going to play e5, and if you just take it mindlessly, well, then they're going to take back, and with threats like knight c7, this is almost borderline losing. So, technically, black can hang in the position by instead playing uh, knight h5, and after e takes d6, you don't really want to take, because again, knight c7 check, but instead you, you take here, and after queen e2 check, king d7 is technically holding in the game, but... You know, do you, do you really want to play a move like king d7? If not, then listen up because uh, the move I'm going to suggest is g5 instead, counterattacking the bishop here. The idea being that now if they take it, knight takes e4, and the point is that now when we take on e4, we're attacking the bishop at the same time. If they move away, we can move back, and now if they go queen e2, there's a very nice detail of going rook a6, narrowly protecting the d6 pawn, and pretty much if they just, you know, develop, we can take the d5 pawn, we could also just develop a piece. Uh, if they protect it, well, we're going to play bishop g7, castle, and as I mentioned earlier, we are basically going to be better if we can just have their knight stranded on the b5 square, where it sort of, you know, has a tough time coming back to civilization. And so for all those reasons, uh, you know, the, the so-called Zaitsev variation or whatever, it's not something you should be scared of, but it's something which you need to be precise against. Otherwise, again, you could uh, have a pretty tough life out there. But okay, wrapping up, I want to talk about less so ideas, and we have touched on a fair bit of theory just by necessity in this video, but this part I really do consider optional, and only for those who really want to extend their theoretical knowledge, because you, I don't know, like wasting your life, I guess, like me. Uh, but okay, uh, for example, one interesting line which has come up quite a lot in the last few years, and well, it's been known for quite a while, but I think has taken a while to really become common knowledge among uh, more players, and maybe still isn't really common knowledge, is a line where uh, black delays g6, and I was talking about way earlier in the video how like this is a kind of more accurate move order to, you know, play g6 instead of taking on a6, uh, however, the line I'm going to show you isn't really related to that point, it, instead the idea is we're not even going to take on a6, we're going to play what is instead known as the Perinovic line, named after, I believe it's like some Serbian grandmaster who played this line a lot, where uh, after bishop g7, the idea is to go e4, and not even play d6, just to play castles, and invite white to try and just basically run us over with e5, knight e8, and basically the point is if they try and protect the center, we're just going to counterattack and have a lot of counterplay. And to be honest, I would probably consider this line to be a little bit objectively better than the taking immediate one. It won't matter so much if you're like anywhere under 2000, especially 2000 online, I believe. You know, people just, even if they know, for example, the a4 line that we talked about uh, earlier in this position where, you know, uh, say here they go, and I know I recommend to go queen b6, but even if they do know this and they get this on the board, it's not going to be the end of the world. I think you can play, say, for example, rook a6, queen a8. This is a tricky line where you try to go e6 and get counterplay in the d5 one. I just find it difficult because even though, you know, this is called a refutation, it's like if there are two grandmasters playing each other, you know, they're probably going to play it very well and black is going to have a tough time, but between two sub-2000 players, I, I have a difficult time imagining it's going to pan out exactly like that. But again, from like a more purely objective, truth, whatever you want to call it, standpoint, I do believe that probably the Perinovic variation is a little bit better. Still, there are some ways that it can really, as white, put a lot of pressure on it, as I'm going to show right now. But some of the main points uh, is that, say, for example, after knight of three, is a black and a queen a5. And this is a very trappy variation. A lot of people go wrong with right in this position, actually. For example, in 2014, Magnus Carlsen played this against Boris Gelfand in a rapid game. And Gelfand is a very strong player, of course, at his peak. Uh, was a world championship challenger, 2700 rated. And even he in this position just basically fucked up very badly. He played bishop d3. And if you want to try and pause the video and figure out why this is bad, I suggest you try and figure that out. But the idea is that black can play knight takes d5 with the point that e takes d5, bishop takes d3 check, takes, and uh, now this is a fork, and the only way to protect it is to go bishop d2, but then you lose uh, this bishop, and of course black is not only equal in material, but is going to have a bunch of free pawns to pick up in the near future, which is why probably a better move for white to play instead of bishop d3 is to uh, neutralize this pin. But still, these positions, I think after bishop takes a6, uh, say for example, takes takes, queen e2, uh, e6 is known to be quite good for black. You could also go d6, of course, and, and this is completely fine, but e6 is another interesting option available in these lines because we did not commit to it earlier on. However, some of the more critical tries against the Perinovich variation, let's say, one is this move to go a7 
And basically the idea is that now after rook takes a7, knight f3, the black probably is going to have to go for something more like d6, e6. They can't really put a queen on a5 anymore because the rook is on a7. Uh, if that doesn't make sense, I'll show you right now. So bishop d2, imagine. Uh, and let's say you want to play any random move like d6. Well, now knight b5, uh, and not only is the queen attacked, but also the rook is attacked. Uh, you know, in the other variation, let's say this one, for example, right? Uh, you know, black could play bishop takes a6. Uh, but there was no knight b5 stuff like there is, uh, again, coming back to this variation because the rook was an a8 there. Uh, here, that's just not the case. And uh, again, white's going to win the exchange now. Not very fun, which is why typically in these positions, again, black plays something like e6. And after bishop e2 takes, takes d6, castles, you know. You know, white is a little bit better by objective standards, but I think for the practical player, especially like sub 2200 or whatever, like this is perfectly playable. You're going to have a pretty you know, fighting game. But the thing which scares me a lot more than this variation, which, you know, just sort of ensues in more of a, you know, long struggle, we could call it, are the positions where white plays e5. And uh, I talked about earlier how something like f4 is probably not so concerning, neither is knight f3. Uh, but rather what is actually very scary is white just playing h4, an idea we've talked about a couple times throughout this video. But in this case, the, the move h4 basically implies the sacrifice of the e5 pawn. And the main line continues like bishop e5, bishop h6 or something, knight g7, h5. And to be honest, I think this position is playable for black, but it's extremely double-edged, very dangerous. Not only black, actually, but I think sometimes it can be dangerous for white. And also, in case you're curious, uh, you do sort of have to take the pawn on e5. I've played this a bit with white, and I've had people say, for example, play h5 against me, which is not good because white just plays g4 and really just slams through on the king side and absolutely demolishes everything. Uh, if you try to go to d6 as well, for example, that also doesn't work very well because e6 takes and then h5 is very unpleasant. But okay, again, I think this position you sort of have to go for. Maybe it's like knight f3, I think, and then bishop f6, h5, something like that, right? And while you might be thinking this sort of looks a little bit scary, I think it's also important to keep things in perspective that basically no one bloody knows about e5, uh, h4, unless they have some super high-level opening course or... They're like me and they just somehow know of this stuff because they know so much opening theory. But yeah, again, printed variation, how do you get to this? G6, knight c3, you don't take on a6, not immediately, never pretty much. In this position, you try to go queen a5, but there's some slightly, you know, annoying lines like a7, e5, and you, you want to make sure that you do your research before you really get into these uh, lines yourself. But finishing up the video, I want to talk about this idea e6 in this position where, you know, black doesn't go for the more conventional takes or the Perinovich line, the fully accepted variation. They instead just go for something completely different, e6, which, again, we've seen this idea a few times throughout this video. I think it's very much inspired by the modern engines where they basically have zero respect for, like, chess culture or whatever you want to call it, playing the more, like, conventional ways that we've established for whatever openings. Instead, they just pick whatever they concretely like. And it just so happens that this exact setup seems to work well against various of White's, you know, tries that they can play against the Benko. And just to show one small excerpt from a game, knight c3 is pretty much what is always played. Uh, takes, takes, bishop e7. Usually people play knight takes e7, takes. Uh, e3 is a very common move, castles, knight f3. And you know, this actually doesn't seem like too crazy a position. Maybe you think d5 is going to happen next. Bishop a6 sort of reminds you a bit of a Blumenfeld or some other stuff we've seen throughout this video. But what black actually played in this game, and is actually quite thematic for this exact variation, is play rook takes a6. And the whole idea is that uh, after bishop takes a6, uh, bishop takes a6, well, now white can't really castle, which is why we uh, typically see, like, let's say, uh, bishop e2, let's say knight e4, so this is a very common idea, castles, and uh, black is a very thematic move of going rook h6, or maybe even rook g6, and after something like, let's say, knight c6, d6, trying to bring a bishop into the game, maybe the queen eventually somehow, Black is going to have very dangerous counterplay, and this isn't really something I'd personally want to play with the white pieces. In this game, white was feeling very brave, and they actually decided to play bishop takes a6, which I'm not sure the engines actually appreciate that much, but this is what white tried in the game, and it was very risky, to, to say the least, after takes. Uh, white has a lot of troubles castling kingside. I think the engine's top move was to actually play knight g1, knight e2, and then castle, which I think is saying something. So, uh, in the game, white tried to play queen a4, and develop on the queen side like this, but this was incredibly risky. And after long castles, knight takes f2, you know, we were winning back material at the very least, and uh, I think it was safe to say that the opening was a pretty resounding success for black. They went on to lose the game, but that definitely was not a result of what happened thus far. But anyways, that is pretty much wrapping up this video. This has taken a while to put together, record and whatnot, so you know, 
I'd appreciate if you guys, if you liked it, of course, uh, please leave a like on the video, share with anyone you might think it's useful for, and uh, yeah, some other stuff. If you're interested in coaching, reach out to me for that. Uh, there's a Discord server, which you can join, talk to some of the guys in the community, email newsletter, Twitter, all links in the bio, but anyways, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed it, uh, yeah, I mean, I've already said that part. I hope you guys have a good day. See you until next time.